Everyone knows that Florida is a natural wonderland of uniquely adapted plants and animals. And in today's episode of The Wild Report, we're headed to one of the Sunshine State's most unique habitat types on the hunt for some of the most bizarre invertebrates you've ever seen. My name is Ben Zeno, and my mission is to inspire you to learn about and conserve the amazing wildlife that's just waiting to be discovered all around us. The scrub can be a pretty difficult place to make a living if you're a plant or animal. So almost all of the species that can be found here have specialized adaptations that increase their fitness in this unique system, including the invertebrates we're hunting today. Okay, this is a wickedly cool insect and something that I don't often get to see back in North Carolina. This is actually not one, but two, two striped walking sticks. This one's enormous. Okay, let's see if we can do a crawl on me. Look at that. That is just a wild looking insect. Now, the large individual, the one on the bottom here, this is the female. And this, I would say, is about maximum size. Two and a half inches or so is how big they get. But this little guy right there, that's the male. So this is actually a breeding pair of two-striped walking sticks. Their colors can change a lot throughout their geographic distribution. Like in North Carolina, they're pretty much just a solid tan brown. But these, you can actually see they have two orange stripes. Now that's a pretty bright coloration, and that's because these actually are armed with defensive chemicals. They can spray with extreme accuracy a spray, and I'm trying not to get sprayed, of anisomorphol, which is actually powerful enough to partially blind humans. So hopefully I don't get blinded after this encounter. But other than those defensive chemicals, there is not really anything these can do to hurt you. They're not going to bite you or sting you or anything like that. So they look a little weird, but you don't got to squash them if you see them. They're pretty calm, herbivorous insects. If you leave them alone, they'll just do their thing. If you pick them up like this, they might spray you in the eyes, but hopefully we'll get her back before she decides to take that course of action. Here you go. Sorry to interrupt you guys. Most of the invertebrates in this system aren't found above ground, like the walking sticks. And our next target species actually lurks deep below the sandy surface. This little hole right here does not look like much, but potentially inside this hole, is a really unique arachnid. And the only way we're going to be able to encounter one during daylight hours is going to be by basically fishing for it. There it is. You see it? It's grab, oh, it just bit. This is a pretty big one. Trying to catch these is tr pretty tricky because you've got about a second. After lots of fishing, Spencer managed uh, to pull through him? with yep. an amazing spider capture. This is a, whoa. This is a very special kind of wolf spider that is in the genus Geolycosa which is the burrowing wolf spiders. These spend the vast majority of its life underground in those burrows, and they line those burrows with silk strands that reach all the way up to the surface. So if I am another small arthropod, and I walk beside that burrow, I'm going to get my feet stuck in those really sticky strands. And then, just like we saw with the fishing rods, they'll run up to the top of the burrow and venomate that prey item and drag it down for consumption, which is a pretty helpful lifestyle because although spiders obviously are predators of many arthropods, they also have so many natural enemies. They don't have any biological armor or chemical defenses like some of our herbivorous insects do. So really this creature's main anti-predatory tactic is just to stay buried in the ground. And the other cool thing about this particular spider is this is the only place where we can actually find it. They are scrub obligates, and obligate species have to be in a very particular range of conditions, and this is that particular range of conditions that this species requires for survival. So we'll go ahead and get this one right back in its burrow and hopefully it catches a nice juicy meal tonight. Despite their impressive hunting strategy, it's not the burrowing wolf spider that rules the invertebrate world here in central Florida. That title belongs to a much more terrifying creature, which even I am a bit hesitant to handle. Oh, look, I think that's a viridis. I'm just gonna scoop him. Oh, there he goes. Scoop him. Got him. Nice. Okay, now in this container right here, we have a pretty special organism. It's actually my very first member of its genus that I've ever seen here. Well, that I've ever seen. <laughs> this is my very first Scolopendra. Scolopendra is a group of centipedes that are commonly known as the giant centipedes. I have heard of people having terrible experiences being bitten by them. So I'll see if he wants to crawl out. <laughs> He's really beautiful. Hello. Okay, he's acting like he did yesterday, for now. So, this is Scolopendra viridis, otherwise known as the Florida Blue Centipede. They actually range all the way up into my home state of North Carolina. Now, I've never seen one there. They're far more common 
down this way. But as you can see, despite the fact that this is a fully fossorial creature, it's still a very, very fast and agile arthropod. And this is a competent predator. So it's using its speed, its agility, and its strength to overpower prey. But not just that, this creature also has incredibly potent venom for, ow, he bit me. Crap, he's going under my shirt. Yeah, yeah, it was just a little pinch. So uh, it just bit me, it actually didn't hurt that bad, but it might've been a dry bite because this venom can cause excruciating pain. He's looking to bite me again. Whew. I read on the internet that these bites hurt kind of like being burned or stapled, but that's not what I just experienced. It really did just feel like a tiny little pinch when he grabbed onto me. So centipedes are often treated as a pest species and most of the information I could find about Viridis online is actually from pest control companies. And I know it might be tempting because they look so freaky and they have that venomous bite to want to remove them. But actually if they're in your house, they're doing you a service because they're cleaning up pests like cockroaches that can transmit diseases to you. You actually do want these around. This is not an organism that you need to be scared of or fear. And trust me, I am one of those people who I look at this and I say, it's terrifying, but having one in my hand and working with it, it is really not so bad after all. And they are really important predators of the invertebrate world. Spencer says they always bite him. Every single one I've held has bitten me. So we'll see if this one is any different. There must be something about you. Something. There it goes. There it goes. Immediately. Did it bite you? Yep, immediately. No way. Fang immediately no came out. No way. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that they might be biting me is I, it, my skin might taste or smell different and that might be stressing them out because these guys actually understand their world entirely through smell. They have eyes, but they're really more for just kind of seeing light and dark. So right now he can feel, he can see that he's exposed. And look at him biting the container. Yeah, that's crazy. He's not happy now. Um, <laughs> he's you see that? Look, look, at, look, yeah. at, look at him biting the container. Wow, that's... <laughs> Spencer, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> you saw, I didn't do anything. I just thought, it's I just... crazy, this. And when they're exposed like this, that they're seeing light, that means they need to get to cover and they are not happy because unlike other arthropods, the centipede actually has a little bit of a weakness. See, they, they're fast, they're strong, they have this flexible exoskeleton that can kind of squeeze into just about any, anywhere. There's pretty much no invertebrate that can really escape them. You cannot outclimb them, you can't outburrow them, and for the most part, you can't even outrun them. So like, if this was four feet long, you can guarantee they'd probably eat people Ugh. too. But because of how like prolific they are, you'd think, well, there's gotta be some kind of catch, right? Because if they're so prolific, how are they not the most dominant animal in every ecosystem? Why is this not an apex predator? And the reason being is they actually have a weakness. And like a lot of amphibians, the sun kills them. And the reason is, there's a trade-off. To have that flexible exoskeleton that can kind of squeeze and squish into like really crazy cramped places, they actually lack a waxy cuticle, something that helps them retain water. So it's not the heat necessarily that kills them. When they're actually out and exposed, they lose water really quickly and they actually dry out. That's why he's so unhappy. I don't know why <laughs> yeah. he's exceptionally unhappy when he crawls on me, but yeah, they're tough to film. Impossible. Florida blues but we are did annoying. it. <laughs> If you enjoyed learning about some of Florida's weirdest invertebrates, be sure to check out this video where I uncover the secrets of North Carolina's invasive praying mantis. Here's your sneak peek at the species that will be featured in the next episode of The Wild Report. Until next time, stay curious and keep adventuring everywhere. This has been Zeno of The Wild Report, signing out.